Good morning, afternoon, evening, and welcome to Lisa Loves. Um, thank you for visiting my channel. Um, today I want to put out a warning. Um, the, the, the case that I'm going to actually discuss today is one that is very, very upsetting, very disturbing, and actually um, involves the death of an eight-year-old boy. Um, I just want to put that out there. It's obviously going to be very triggering for most people. It is very upsetting. Um, I'm covering this one because of the recent release of a documentary on Netflix by the name of The Trials of Gabriel Fernandez. This was directed by um, quite a well-known director, documentary director Brian Knappenberger and was released on the 26th of February 2020. There are six episodes, each round about an hour long, so quite a detailed and involved documentary which I watched myself a few days ago. Um, I must apologise, during the video I may get a bit croaky, I may need to stop for a bit of a cough. Um, I've, I've had the flu, I'm still not completely 100% over it, but um, let's get down to the subject in hand. I'm discussing Netflix's The Trials of Gabriel Fernandez. So little Gabriel Fernandez was born on the 21st of February 2005 and tragically on the 24th of May 2013, just a few months after his 8th birthday, Gabriel's young life would tragically be cut short at the hands, believe it or not, of his mother Pearl and her living boyfriend Isaro Igiri. Gabriel was the youngest of three children, with elder brother Ezekiel and elder sister Virginia. His mother was Pearl Fernandez and his father was Arnold Contreras, who was actually in prison at the time of Gabriel's birth. He did spend a lot of time in and out of prison on um, robbery charges and possession. So he wasn't really a constant in his young children's lives. When Pearl Fernandez initially became pregnant with Gabriel, um, initially she didn't actually want to continue with the pregnancy. She wasn't interested in raising him. But Pearl's uncle, what would go on to be Gabriel's great uncle, Michael Carranza, and his partner, David Martinez, actually desperately wanted a child of their own and offered to actually bring up Gabriel on behalf of Pearl. And on day three of Gabriel's life, she called up her uncle and said, come get your child, he's annoying me already. He is really irritating me. She just wanted rid of Gabriel. She just was not in any way interested in him. And her uncle, just absolutely over the moon to have the chance to bring up this beautiful little boy, came and collected Gabriel from the hospital. So Michael and David, um, a gay couple, went on to raise Gabriel for the first four years of his life and Gabriel was seen to be very happy in this loving and nurturing environment. Um, he very much loved his, his uncles and he was always reported to be a very kind and loving child, really just wanting to be with a family who loved him. But when Gabriel was a little bit older, his maternal grandfather decided that it wasn't the done thing, it wasn't the right thing for two gay men to be raising a young boy and he, with his wife, decided that from this point on that they would raise Gabriel as their own. And the two uncles still had very much and they still saw Gabriel, as all this time Pearl did actually still see Gabriel and Gabriel was very much aware that Pearl was his mother but she didn't have the stereotypical, the standard mother in role. She didn't take much of an interest in him whatsoever but um, it's important to note that she was there, she could see him, he knew who she was. Um, but as I say, he moved from the care of his two uncles to the care of his grandfather and the grandfather's wife. And in that household, he also was in a very loving, nurturing environment, albeit perhaps with some morals that wouldn't be strictly to my sort of mindset what the problem was with him living with their uncles when he was clearly so very happy. That's another, that's an argument for another video. But um, he did lead a very happy life in that environment up until he was seven years old. So during this time, Pearl does have custody of Gabriel's two elder siblings, Ezekiel and Virginia. And her own family had on numerous occasions made reports to welfare that they were concerned that she was not, she was neglecting her kids. Um, she wasn't raising them correctly. She wasn't feeding them properly. And even in one instance, um, Ezekiel was actually injured in a car accident, which was said to be down to Pearl's negligence and her carelessness. So very much the family weren't particularly happy with her mothering skills, with how she presented herself. But unfortunately, when Gabriel turned seven, she decided to apply for custody back. Um, and it is said that she was just quite simply interested in the welfare payments that having Gabriel in the household would generate for her. 
So it was very much suggested that um, Pearl's boyfriend at the time, Isaro Aguirre, um, had made the suggestion to Pearl to gain custody of Gabriel for these payments, but it's not strictly been, been like ever proven whose idea this was, but indeed they do apply for custody. And even though on her record, it is down that the children she currently cares for are high risk, Apparently in LA, in the state in which they live, it's very much child services um, whole ambition, aim, drive to allow children to stay with their, their biological parents and to do everything to encourage them to be in that environment. So Pearl inexplicably um, gains custody of Gabriel when he is seven years old. So in October 2012, at the age of seven, Gabriel went to live with his mum and his mum's boyfriend. It's worth saying at this time also that the investigations into the claims from the family of neglect um, of the two um, older siblings were seen to be unfounded um, and there was no evidence that the children were indeed neglected or um, were at any risk. Even though it does actually suggest on their file that there is issue there, it's kind of a grey area which to me makes absolutely no sense but anyway, Gabriel moves back in with his mum October 2012 and this is when the problems unfortunately started. Gabriel would regularly be seen with cuts and bruises and scabs and scars resembling cigarette burns. He became quite withdrawn. He was a very open, loving, bubbly, happy little boy previously and he started to become quite withdrawn and, and quite reserved. And his teacher Jennifer Garcia, bless the woman, just watching this documentary how much she tried for little Gabriel. Um, she noticed little signs that got worse over time. Initially she would notice cuts, bruises. He would always explain them away. He fell off his bike, um, he bumped into something. There was always another reason, but he would show up looking unkempt. And on one occasion he asked her, is it normal for mums to beat their kids? And she was kind of taken back by the question, but she said, well, yes, some, some parents do discipline their children that way and then he said is it normal for them to bleed now obviously she was very taken back by this and quite concerned she didn't want to initially sort of show that to Gabriel so she sort of tried to, to question a bit further gently um, and Gabriel told her that um, he would be beaten with a belt but with the metal with the buckle part of the belt to the point that he would bleed He's like, well, sometimes my mom makes me bleed. And I said, well, where do you bleed? And he said, well, on my body. Because she hits me with a belt. And he's like, you know that part with the metal on it? Mm -hmm. He's like, that part. It was at this stage that Jennifer Garcia made her first um, contact to Child Welfare Services and reported that she was concerned about Gabriel, about what was happening at home. Um, and she thought in good faith that um, they would go and investigate and something would be done about this. So over the weeks and months that followed, um, the teacher was quite concerned about Gabriel. He did not seem himself. He did seem withdrawn, although he was a very popular young boy. Um, he, he was friendly. He had friends within the class. That was my friend and it really caught me because it was his parent who took his life. She still saw troubling signs, bruises. Um, and she, again, made contact with LA County Child Services and a social worker by the name of Stephanie Rodriguez. She contacted this lady on numerous occasions and was told at every stage of, of reports that something would be done, someone would be sent in to investigate. But in every situation, Stephanie Rodriguez would just allow Pearl to just explain everything away, would blame young Gabriel would say that he was lying, that he was dishonest. Um, some cases she wouldn't answer the door. And she said that she saw no cause to remove Gabriel. She didn't see any evidence of, of any mistreatment. Even though this young boy was covered in bruises and scabs and marks that were very, very, very obviously cigarette burns, there was always an excuse. And Gabriel was made out to be dishonest and to be a liar and a troublemaker. So the teacher, Jennifer Garcia, is getting, is reaching the point of desperation and she actually talks to her headmaster about the issue and, and makes them aware of her feelings and the fact that she doesn't feel anything's been done and she says, should we take pictures? Have you seen the marks on his face, on his head? And 
the headmasters very much no we we're not investigators we're not here to do that you need to stay out of the situation you're a reporter you report the abuse and then you'll leave it to child services it's their job they should be dealing with this not you so heartbreakingly in the documentary um we actually also see during the time that gabriel is undergoing horrendous abuse at home which which i will get to at a later date warning it is very upsetting um it was just before mother's day and one of the class activities the kids were making mother's day cards and Gabriel had made a beautiful card with this house and a little window opened um, and behind the door it says who loves you and a picture of Gabriel and he'd done this for his mum along with a list of reasons that he loved her and knowing what happened in hindsight watching that and seeing that is just heartbreaking and how that woman can even breathe air with what she's done is just it's beyond me I maybe shouldn't be putting personal viewpoint into telling you a story but and I'm unable not to in this case, I'm afraid. So Gabriel continues to come to school with marks and on one occasion he comes with a very unusual hairstyle. Sections of his hair have been shaved off, but in no particular fashion. Um, and underneath these shaved sections are scabs and marks. He seems to have black eyes. He's got a busted lip. Um, his He seems to have areas of skin on his face, which are almost looked burned um, and he had been absent from school following one of the reports that um, his teacher again made to his social worker and child services and he had been absent from school I think for 13 days um, and he came back and his teacher Jennifer was so glad to see him back in the classroom but she noticed instantly the markings on his face, his even more withdrawn attitude and she made him stay behind after class and she questioned him like Gabriel what's happened what what's the marks on your face and initially he gave a different excuse he said he fell or he said he came off his dirt bike um, and it was very clear to his teacher that this was not the case and eventually after pressing him further he admitted that his mother had shot him in the face with a BB gun um, obviously the teacher is aghast um, and again wants to call child services and this social worker that seemingly to this point has done jack shit to be quite honest but Gabriel heartbreakingly tells her don't call that woman when you call that woman things get worse for me so she sat there wondering as this teacher what should I do I need to protect this child my headmaster won't let me do anything more if I call Stephanie Rodriguez is she gonna go back in Pearl's going to tell more lies and then I'm going to make it worse for little Gabriel. What do I do? And she deliberated about this. She really did not know what to do, but she couldn't in good conscience not report the injuries. So again, she contacts Stephanie Rodriguez and makes her aware of the injuries that she has seen on Gabriel and what he has said has actually happened. So again, Stephanie Rodriguez obviously goes out to see Pearl. Pearl explains it away again, um, is accused of telling lies. Stephanie Rodriguez seems completely happy with the care that Gabriel's receiving at home, even though later on paperwork he would be seen as being at high risk. At no stage was there any suggestion made that Gabriel should be removed from the care of his mother. Are you sure that that's what really happened? And then he did eventually tell me and he was like really angry and he you know, he said, well, it's because my mom shot me in the face with a BB gun. Garcia said she called DCFS multiple times and then realized Gabriel was suffering more abuse because of it. A metal baton and wooden bats. Aguirre's trial revealed that Gabriel would be beaten anytime social workers would ask questions about his injuries. I didn't want to call. I didn't know what to do. I don't know how I could look at his face and, you know, not be able to assure him that that wasn't going to happen again when I couldn't say that. When Gabriel was absent for several days, Garcia was told he had been sent to live with family in Texas. The teacher hoped this was true. Roughly a week later, Gabriel was dead. It's worth noting, as well as the teacher making these reports, various family members of Pearl had actually also made reports and had even contacted the local sheriff's office, who had made multiple house calls to the home had spoken to Pearl on multiple occasions and was happy with her excuses, had believed that Gabriel was a compulsive liar and a troublemaker and had even taken Gabriel into their police car 
and had chastised him, had told him off and threatened him and told him he needed to stop making up these lies. He needed to stop trying to get his mother in trouble or he could be taken away to prison. So they consistently believe this poor parent over a child sat in front of them with black eyes, a bus lip, scars all over him. What went on is just, I, I have no words. So the plot deepens even before the, the horrendous night in question. I am going to refer to my paperwork here because I am going to get this wrong and I want to get it right for you. So Child Services did use a for-profit company by the name of Maximus. Maximus is a company that helps run government services like Medi-Aid or foster care. The resulting industry is strip mining billions in federal aid and funds from impoverished families, abused and neglected children, the disabled elderly and the poor. So Arturo Miranda Martinez is a security guard in the gain offices of Maximus. So strictly speaking, it says, LA County's Department of Public Social Services, greater avenues for independence or gain offices. So he actually sees Gabriel one day, sees it, the same shaved head, the marks, the black eyes, the fat lip, um, and he looks at him and he sees abuse. This is the words he used. I looked at the boy and I saw abuse. Initially, he actually contacts a colleague by the name of Maricela Corona, who was actually trained in domestic violence. She wanted to report the suspected abuse that she had been alerted to, but her supervisor um, told her that they did not want to continue. And are you ready for this excuse? It was just before 5pm on a Friday afternoon and they did not want to pay the overtime that would be required to investigate the situation further. So Arturo is one of those nature's nice guys. He's not to be dissuaded from this. He actually picks up, now this is not his job, this guy's a security guard. He picks up the phone and he phones his own supervisor who says to him, not your job, do not get involved. Not content with that, Arturo picks up the telephone again and actually calls 911 and he reports this child abuse neglect. Um, he explains what he has seen, how this child appears. He said he's worried for this child's safety. He feels that his hands are tied. Nobody is interested in investigating. And he is told, this is an emergency line, this is not an emergency, please do not call here again. I suggest you call your local sheriff's office. So diligently, Arturo picks up the phone and he calls his local government office to report the abuse and neglect of little Gabriel. They say they will investigate as they have on so many previous occasions, only to be fobbed off yet again. 29 days after this day, Gabriel would be dead. So on May 22nd, 2013, Pearl Fernandez makes a call to 911 stating that her son Gabriel is not breathing following falling and hitting his head. When officers arrive on scene, the first thing they are told by Pearl and her boyfriend, um, Isaro Aguirre, is that Gabriel is gay. They're very puzzled and confused by this because what relevance this have is anyone's guess. They go in to do their job. Now I just again going to refer to below so I don't leave anything out here because the wounds are so extensive, um, it's just ridiculous. They discovered Gabriel covered in severe burns with a fractured skull. Now not just a hairline fracture or a crack, this was actually a type of fracture where a whole area of the skull could be pressed in and could be felt from the outside of the head. Um, it was like a depressed fracture. He had broken ribs. He had BB pellets lodged under his skin, in his lung and in his groin. He had ligature marks. He had skin missing from his throat. He had bruising and cuts all over his face, black eyes, and was just in a horrific state. AFD paramedic James Cermak, the first witness on the stand, said he couldn't believe what he saw when he responded to the 911 call of Gabriel in cardiac arrest at a Palmdale apartment back on May 22, 2013. The more you looked, the more you saw it. Just, it, it was just unbelievable, the amount of trauma on, on his body. Uh, left palm uh, looked like it was burned, bite marks, bruises, head to toe, uh, skull fractures. Every inch of Gabriel was bruised and swollen. Um, his skin was kind of a black and blue mottled color. I remember he felt cold to the touch. His cigarette burns on his body and bruising throughout his entire body and it looked like uh, his penis uh, had somebody attempted to cut it off. And you testified that 
pretty much every inch of Gabriel's body was covered in injuries. These are multiple injuries um, uh, of, of different types. There were abrasions, there were open wounds, there was bruising, there was swelling, there was marks on the legs, there was skin missing off the top of the neck. I felt terrible. I've never seen anything in my, in, in my entire career. I've never seen anything like that. I wasn't prepared. Gabriel, as was reported on the 911 call, was not breathing. So obviously paramedic staff immediately started performing CPR and started doing everything they could to give Gabriel the best chance at life. Now on the 911 call, there were more than one. At one stage, when Azaro was being actually instructed how to do CPR, he worked as a security guard and he had training in CPR. He told them he knew what to do. He told them that he was administering CPR to Gabriel. But um, you kind of, the, the people that handled the call said it did not sound like that was the case. Um, you can tell the effort of a person trying to perform CPR. And also, Gabriel was covered in blood. Um, when they arrived on scene, Izaro had no blood whatsoever on his face. Um, and if he had been performing mouth to mouth, obviously with the amount of blood that was on Gabriel, he would have some signs himself and there were none whatsoever. So Gabriel is taken to hospital in an ambulance and we are told by officers that were at the scene that neither Azaro or Gabriel's mother Pearl showed any interest whatsoever in going in that ambulance with Gabriel to hospital. They let that little boy go to hospital in that ambulance on his own. When he reached hospital, Gabriel was pronounced brain dead. He was actually kept on machines but they were switched off two days later. He never regained consciousness and he was pronounced dead on the 24th of March. 2013, a mere three months after his eighth birthday. Something else to actually note about the scene um, after Gabriel was taken to hospital, investigators were obviously sent in um, and if you're aware of how they work, any signs of blood in an apartment in a building will be marked by little red arrows pointing to different areas of blood. There was so much blood in the apartment even though, at a later date, um, when the siblings were interviewed, um, Virginia actually admitted that her mum made her help her clean up blood in the apartment um, between the ambulance being called and arriving. But there was so much blood in the apartment, all over the apartment, that they ran out of red stickers and they had to switch to a different colour. And there are photographs in the documentary showing all these stickers and it, it's just, it's brutal. And to actually know that that's an eight-year-old boy, a little eight-year-old boy, and there is just blood everywhere. And if you look at Azaro, he is a big, hefty, strong, he's a bouncer, he's a security guard. Very big, strong, strapping man. And he has beaten this little eight-year-old boy to death. Shu described while the jury looked at photo after photo of blood stains and indentation marks on the walls. The yellow arrows indicate blood stains that I had tested. They tested positive for blood. You previously used red. Why did you use yellow here? I changed to yellow because I ran out of red stickers. Shu did DNA tests on items in the home with blood on them, including a wooden club, a black bat, and a data cord. She says his DNA was also found right. inside the cabinet. Prosecutors say Gabriel was locked in for hours with no food or water or access to the bathroom, bound and gagged. In the apartment also, inexplicably, blood was found pulled at the bottom of the sink, so obviously some effort had been made to try and wash something. And there was also blood in the bottom of the shower, but Izaro had admitted carrying um, Gabriel into the shower to try to rouse him with cold water because he wouldn't wake. Um, and, and that was what he did. So this little boy, in reality, had been beaten within an inch of his life, unconscious, perhaps dead at this stage. And his action is to take him into the shower and to switch cold water on him. Also, while looking around the apartment, the police could not find any possessions of Gabriel's. And at a later date, they found all of his clothes crumpled in a ball, in bin bags. Obviously not having been worn, not having been taken care of, and there were two pretty dresses hung in the wardrobe, which we later found out that they forced Gabriel to wear. They called Gabriel gay on many occasions. They told anyone that would listen that Gabriel was gay in a very scathing, judgmental, nasty way. This is because Gabriel was raised initially by his two great uncles from when he was born to four, 
and he had great love for them and he said he loved them and because he loved these two uncles who were gay Gabriel must therefore be gay. So this little boy was just constantly humiliated, put in dresses, laughed at, they put makeup on his face, they called him names, they humiliated him at every opportunity. It, it's just, it's heartbreaking. So I've got some findings here um, that came to light after the autopsy, um, that came to light with questioning of the siblings that I'm going to read out to you because as I say the list is so extensive I'm going to forget some things so um, I will warn you that this is upsetting. Um, this is an eight-year-old boy we're talking about. So um, there's evidence in Gabriel's stomach that he was fed cat litter. When um, questioned his older sibling Virginia said that Gabriel's job was to clean the cat litter and if his mother and stepdad I suppose felt he didn't do a good job <clears throat> They made him eat the cat litter and cat litter was found in Gabriel's stomach. Um, there was evidence he had been starved. Every night Gabriel would be locked in a tiny cupboard at the bottom of his mother and Azaro's bed. The cupboard would be handcuffed closed and Gabriel would be made sleep inside this tiny cramped cupboard. They would stuff a sock in his mouth and a bandana around his head, covering his mouth to make sure he couldn't shout out and couldn't scream he wasn't given food. His siblings would try to sneak him food through a little hole, a little crack in, in the door um, and would get into a lot of trouble if they were caught doing this. Now that's horrendous enough but um, when the autopsy was performed Gabriel was found to have a lot of bilateral rib fractures which means on both sides but these rib fractures were all at different different stages of healing so Gabriel had had his ribs broken on numerous occasions. Now I don't know if you've ever had a broken rib, but the pain is severe. And as the actual coroner said that when you have rib fractures like these that Gabriel had, breathing hurts. This little boy was curled in a ball in the fetal position every night in a cupboard, starved, worked, beaten with broken ribs and God only knows what other injuries on any particular occasion. They knocked his teeth out with a baseball bat and didn't get him any dental or medical help. Um, they beat him with this baseball bat on numerous occasions, which was found to have Gabriel's blood on it and there were chunks missing of this bat. They'd beaten him so hard. Um, he was shot in the face in other places with a baby gun. He was pepper sprayed in the face for the amusement of his mother and Azaro while he sat in the bath crying. He was covered in cigarette burns. His older sister Virginia said that regularly he was choked and lifted clean off the floor by Azaro uh, who held him against a wall with one arm. So strong he was. His hair was shaved off in patches and his head was scabbed as I said before all underneath the shaved sections. He was beaten for playing with dolls, which obviously suggested that he was gay. His older sister Virginia, when she was interviewed, was extremely upset and she felt guilty because she wasn't allowed to play with Gabriel when she was with her friends, her female friends. Um, she was forbidden because this was gay and she felt bad because she hadn't played with Gabriel and she had told him to go away and this little girl was carrying this guilt around with her that she had left Gabriel all on his own. His brother also, um, Ezekiel, carried very similar guilt. I felt that there should have been more that he did to help his brother. These two kids were being mistreated also, obviously not anywhere near like Gabriel was. Gabriel just seemed to be there to amuse his mother and her boyfriend to be a, an object to torture, because that's what they did. But these other two kids were left scarred and traumatized and one really decent, there's video footage of a really, really decent, nice police officer. Very high up. <coughs> Very high up, actually. He said, I'm the boss in this investigation. And I'm thinking, where are you going with this? I'm the top man. And the top man is telling you something now. You are not to blame. It's not your fault. He's telling this little boy, I think he was maybe 15 or 16 at this stage. This is not your fault you're not to blame for this and these kids are carrying this trauma and this blame around with them for what this evil woman and her evil boyfriend did. 
So again, back to the autopsy. Um, I'm almost at a finish. Um, the autopsy took two days to complete, which is obviously not normal. And the coroner said, now this is a little bit of medical knowledge. Um, everyone has a thymus gland, which is found around here, around their throat. His was barely there. Now, normal boys, the thymus gland weighs up to about 100 grams. Gabriel's was 10 grams. The coroner said this is due to stress atrophy, which basically means this little boy's body had been under such a weight of physical and emotional stress for such a long period of time that this thymus gland had actually shriveled away to nothing. This shows the body just been under an amount of stress emotionally that it just cannot cope with, it cannot manage. And the fact that this is shown in Gabriel shows that these injuries were not just physical, he wasn't just physically abused, we know he was mentally abused. But this young boy's mental health, this young boy's very being, was just slowly being killed. So let's get to the court case, let's get to sentencing. So Pearl and Zara were actually trialled separately and this needed to be the case because they were constantly shouting at one another. So are you ready for the sob story for Pearl and let's see if, unlike me, you feel sorry for her at the end of it. Pearl was of very, very low intelligence. This is said to be because she started using drugs at a very, very early age, which um, inhibited brain development. So she was said to have an IQ of somewhere around 80, which um, is very low. She was diagnosed with depression, bipolar disorder, PTSD. Pearl had a plethora of problems. This I am not denying. The difficulty she had growing up, I am not disputing. But does everyone that has been through these things do what she did to her young son? No. As a matter of fact, a lot of people that have been through horrendous upbringings and have been disadvantaged or whatever has happened to them have struggled will do anything in their power to make sure that the same thing does not happen to their children. And if they feel that they are not suitable parents and they're not going to be good parents, then they should allow the children to be taken into child services and cared for or, in Gabriel's case, he was very happy with his uncles, he was very happy with his grandparents. Why not just leave him there? Greed. Simple. They wanted the benefit money for themselves. In Azaro's case, Azaro was actually... Somebody spoke up for Azaro, a character witness in court, um, who used to work with him at a residential care home that he worked at. She described him as loving, caring, a gentle giant, a teddy bear. As I said before, Izara was a very big, imposing man. Um, she talked about how all, all the elderly residents wanted Izara to care for them, that he would change them, that he would wash them, that he would drive them. Um, when they went on outings, he would drive them around coastal areas so that they could see the sights. She painted a picture of a very decent, nice, humble, loving man. And she said that what she had been told just did not sound right. Even though the whole time Azaro actually had admitted that all these acts that he did, that he lost his temper with Gabriel, that he did beat him, that he took it too far, that he did call him gay, that all of the, everything I've told you, Azaro admitted every last bit of this. This woman still went to court and gave him a character reference. What, what is these people thinking? So to sentencing, um, in Izaro's case, Izaro was actually tried first. Now this is very rare. Due to the prolonged torture that little Gabriel had endured and due to his murder, Izaro was actually tried on first degree murder with the death penalty as, as an outcome. Now the, the jury were actually 11 to 1. They There was one gentleman on the jury who was interviewed in the documentary who did not want to see Izaro as guilty. They did go to the judge and the judge said, well, with all due respect, you've only been deliberating for two hours. Go away and talk about it some more. And eventually they did sway this man and they came back with a guilty verdict of first degree murder. But then they had to be sent away a second time to discuss whether or not he would get life imprisonment or if he would be sentenced to the death penalty. Now this had never been done before and this was very seen as very special circumstances. And again, the same man would not agree to. He felt that it wasn't premeditated. Um, he, he just lost it and it happened. Now, as another young girl said that was part of that jury, 
even if during that last beating that man decided I'm just gonna take this to the next level I'm gonna kill him I'm gonna beat him till he's dead that's premeditated you do not have to plan to do it next week or the next day but the upshot is it did come back with guilty of first degree murder um, he was sentenced to the death penalty and Azaro Aguirre currently sits on death row as for Pearl Pearl was actually Pearl actually took a plea deal in response in return for admission of first degree murder and in return for her admitting that they planned to do this she would escape the death penalty and she instead would be sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole so Pearl Fernandez will never see the outside again she is in prison she is certainly not a model prisoner she is very temperamental um, she's just she doesn't think like normal people and um, she showed up in court every day slathered in makeup we saw clips of her being taken out of her cells by um, prison officers shouting and complaining and ranting and raving because they'd taken her makeup all she seemed to worry about was herself was her appearance was just herself nothing outside of that was important to Pearl and um, I would encourage you to watch the documentary as I've said it is very hard to watch there are pictures shown which are very hard to see um, and as a mother of when I watched this an eight-year-old boy um, he's now just turned nine um, this past few days it was very difficult for me to watch because I'm, I'm a mum to, to a young boy and the thought of laying a finger on him and causing him any pain just makes me feel physically sick to my core so this one was a difficult one for me most definitely so in conclusion let me just read out a few little last minute notes I've got here also as well as Pearl and Izaro the four social workers who were involved in this case um, you remember me mentioning Stephanie Rodriguez at the start who was told numerous times by the teacher and was fobbed off on each occasion her and the three other social workers were taken to court now two of these social workers involved not Stephanie but two others were interviewed for the documentary and neither of them felt that they were culpable that they'd done anything wrong that they were to blame took no responsibility whatsoever so they were actually initially taken to court in the first time this sort of things ever happened and charged with child abuse and falsifying records but the criminal charges were later dropped by all four of them so all four of them had no charges but all four of them did lose their jobs so this documentary obviously as well as detailing the evils that little Gabriel endured from his parents and the lack of help and support that was available to him and the social workers that made terrible mistakes. The documentary also very much highlights that there were clear problems with the system from the start. From overworked staff to the system being outsourced to companies for profit to money of all things. And while the Department of Family Services have made improvements in the years since Gabriel's death, 143 children have actually died from abuse or neglect since that time. So there's obviously some issues somewhere that needs to be properly addressed. And five years after Gabriel's death, a little 10 year old boy from Antelope Valley, where Gabriel was actually from, Anthony Avalos was also the victim of abuse and neglect and also actually died from that very same area. He was found to have been denied access to food, to a bathroom, to go to the toilet, and he was abused in a very similar way to Gabriel. And when checking records, 13 reports had actually been made about this by his teachers and by other family members, all of which were found to be unsubstantiated and there was no reason to remove this little boy from the care of his parents. The DCFS never stepped in, never intervened and never helped him. And he met the same fate as little Gabriel. So this kind of thing is still going on, folks, and it's, it's shocking. It shocked me to my very core. Very, very good documentary, very thorough in-depth documentary, very upsetting documentary, but very well made. And I would very much recommend um, it to anyone to watch, if indeed you can bear it. As I say, it's a difficult watch, folks. So um, I don't really know what to say. Um, tell me in the comments how you feel. I can imagine that you all probably feel exactly the same way, that you're all as shocked, disgusted and upset by this case as I am. And perhaps you feel differently about the death penalty in this case. I'm not talking generally. 
Um, in this case, um, obviously, Azara Wagheri is on death row and Pearl Fernandez is now going to be spending a life in prison. And as far as I'm concerned, folks, that's a waste of taxpayer money. And what do you think? Um, let me know below in the comments your thoughts. As always, many, many thanks if you have watched my videos. Um, I've just started this very recently and um, and I was blown away by views I had on my Michael Barrymore case and on the pharmacist video that I did. Um, I would encourage you the last video I did about the crossbow cannibal. Um, now that one hasn't had many views as yet. I would encourage you to go check that one out if you want to. Um, if there are any other cases that you would like me to cover, please let me know in the comments below. I'm always interested in your suggestions. Um, but thank you for watching. Um, i love if you would subscribe to the channel if you enjoy it. A little like there would be awesome. And talk to me in the comments, folks. It may take me a while, but I do get around to reading them. I do read, I do reply. So thanks for watching, guys. It's over a night. Probably still lives.